Hello and uh, happy Friday to everybody. I hope everybody's staying safe out there and finding some peace in this chaotic world that we continue to find ourselves in. And I hope, uh, as we've been saying all along, that these videos still continue to provide some sort of spiritual nourishment, especially for those who uh, um, can't attend church right now. Our heart goes out um, to all of you. Today, if I could, I'd like to maybe just briefly discuss today's feast. And it's the feast of um, Thomas the Apostle. And, um, well, um, you know, Thomas is an saint and I love him because he's an apostle. I probably love this feast a little bit more because of the gospel. And it's the gospel of John, uh, the one commonly known as um, the gospel of doubting Thomas. We've all heard that. I think that's probably the one thing we take from um, our grade school religious set. If we take anything is um, this... Um, is, is that word doubting Thomas. We still use that, maybe not as much today, but that was a common term when I was growing up, you're a doubting Thomas. But if um, we limit today's gospel, which is where Thomas comes who hasn't been with the apostles um, and doesn't believe and then witnesses Jesus alive and well and comes to be, believe, if we just simply limit it to um, nothing else but a conversion of faith, which by the way, don't get me wrong, it is absolutely a conversion of faith and it's important just in that, uh, but we can miss some of the other elements of it about who it says, not just about Thomas and this doubting Thomas figure, uh, but about the person of Jesus Christ. And there's two things I'd like to point out about uh, today's gospel. If you uh, get online um, and look at the lectionary, um, take a chance and read it. Uh, as we know, Thomas comes in and says, if I don't see the wounds in his hands and his side, I won't believe. Jesus comes, shows his wounds, allows Thomas to touch him. He says, my Lord, my God, and Thomas is convinced and becomes a believer. And then he says, blessed are those who have not seen and believe. And Jesus says, referring, quite frankly, to us, to generation after generation of the disciples. But back to these two things I was talking about. First, it says a lot about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, because John is going to great lengths here to paint this picture of a physical Jesus Christ, of a Jesus Christ that you can touch, um, even though he passes through doors and there's a sort of, um, there's a glorification or um, something different about him, he's still very physical. One you can touch, one that they eat and dine with, one that walks with them in Luke's gospel on the road to Emmaus. Now, why is this important? Well, Gerhard Lofink, the scripture scholar, points out that among all the Jewish ideas that might have been flo floating around at that time about the resurrection, and there were um, groups like the Pharisees that believed in the resurrection, most of them would have been something akin to a rapture, um, like what happened to Elijah, this sudden taking up of a, um, someone who died. That would have been probably the, the, the most common theory of the resurrection at that time, which would essentially sort of just fast forward right to the ascension, which we do all the time, by the way. But John and the other gospel writers want to make it absolutely clear that Jesus is physically alive and well. And why is this important? Because there's nothing, as I said in that time, that evidences a physical resurrection, which means that they couldn't have created this story. It wasn't like they were sitting around and Jesus died and they said, we have to tell people something. And so they fabricated this story. It, it wouldn't have worked. It wouldn't have even been in their imaginations. Um, it wouldn't have even been in their mindset to create this crazy account of a physical resurrection. And so first of all, it gives proof to the resurrection. It gives witness to the resurrection that John would even think about writing about a Jesus that could be physically touched. Um, goes a long way to prove that Jesus did rise from the dead um, and did walk this earth among his disciples, was truly resurrected. So that's the first thing. The second thing, and maybe even more important, is that in the resurrection, Jesus continues to bear his physical wounds, the wound in his side and his feet and his hands. He says, Thomas, touch them. These are the wounds that he bore for us. These are the wounds that he bore out of love for us. These are the wounds that he bore for all humanity, which suggests that Jesus, if it's in his resurrection, that Jesus continues to bear the wounds of humanity. That in his resurrection and even in his ascension, it's not like somehow he left all that woundedness aside. No, rather he continues to carry it with him. And this is a God, and I've said this 
over and over again, this is a God that I can embrace. This is a God that I can worship. This is a Jesus Christ that I can pray to, that I can relate to, that I can reach out to, that I can turn to in times of need because he is so personal and continues to be personal. The account of this resurrection and the bearing and the fact that Jesus still bears the wounds of the crucifixion tells me that he continues to enter into my struggles, uh, my pains, uh, all my fears and worries, and, and all these things that make up my humanity, that he does not leave that behind but enters into it over and over and over again. So first, Jesus walked this earth, resurrected, alive and well. Second, Jesus is still alive and well among us, and he continues to bear the wounds of humanity. I've also said this before, there's nowhere that we can go that God cannot go with us. Uh, the term God forsaken us, quite frankly, doesn't mean a lot to me because I don't think that's quite possible. Nowhere we can go that God can't bring us back. And if you don't believe it, it's evidenced in the wounds of Jesus Christ that he still carries with us today. We find ourselves lost, we find ourselves hurt, we find ourselves in pain, and the only savior that works for me in that case is one who still bears the wounds of his crucifixion and therefore still bears the wounds of all humanity. This is true love, and it's exemplified in the person of Jesus Christ. May God's love be with you always, and I look forward to seeing you all very soon. Stay safe.